Good evening. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the first Park Speak of 2021. I'm Kinley Walsh Lawler, President and CEO of Parks California, and I am here at beautiful Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park here in Erlemart, California, in the Central Valley. We have an amazing group of speakers today that are going to take us on the journey, the very special journey of this park. I want to say happy Earth Day. It's what a wonderful way to celebrate to be here in this amazing place. Uh, and one of our first guests is a special one. I'd like to welcome um, the representative for Senator Melissa Hurtado, Senate District 14, Joseph Lopez. So Joseph, thank you so much for joining us tonight virtually. Thank you, Kenley. It's a pleasure to be here today. As mentioned, my name is Joseph Lopez and I am the district representative for State Senator Melissa Hurtado's office. The Senator sends her regrets for not being here, but has sent me to say a few words on her behalf. And on the behalf of the Senator, we would like to commend Parks California for having these virtual guided tours known as Park Speaks. What you are doing today and the other presentations you have already done to highlight our state parks and informing the public on the significance of their importance is a sensational way to plant seeds of excitement and inspiring all to experience these extraordinary places. Again, thank you Parks California for your innovative way to reach out to the public and protecting the natural diversity of our 280 state parks and happy Earth Day. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Joseph. And thank you so much to the center. Please send our best. Well, we have another amazing speaker joining us now, but before I introduce him, I do think it's going to be time for me to walk into the school. <laughs> and with that, I introduce you now to assembly member Devin Mathis of the 26th district. Thank you so much for joining us assembly member. Thank you. It's, um, you know, already been said, but I mean, happy earth day. It's so exciting to see this, to see that, you know, Parks California has figured out a way to get past uh, COVID to virtually tour all of our amazing state parks and to really build this coalition. Um, I'm always proud, especially uh, for Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park and, and everything that's gone into it. So just really happy and excited for everyone and want to thank everybody for coming together to do this. Um, you know, California State Parks Coalition, California Ameri African American Museum, and the Friends of Allensworth State Park. So thank you all. And if I forgot anybody, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm just really excited for all of you and looking forward to this virtual tour. Thank you. Wonderful. What a great way to start our evening off. Just want to make sure logistically we're good. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, this is just such an honor to be in a place that holds such history. And I'm going to let others tell that history um, even better than I could. But first, I am delighted to welcome the State Park Director, Armando Quintero, who's here in person. Armando was able to join us in the last two Park Speaks virtually, but now we're actually able to be here distanced in order to speak together. So Armando, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Kenley, it's a pleasure to be here. So great. And you and I have talked quite a bit about this idea of connecting people to place through storytelling and cultural relevance. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that in relation to Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park. Sure, thank you for that question, Kenley. The, um, you know, the human history here goes back 10,000 years uh, to Larry Lake, which, used to sit exactly where Allensworth is today, was the largest lake west of the Mississippi. It was 40 miles long, and it was fed by the streams and the rivers coming out of the Southern Sierra Nevada. And for the last 10,000 years, at times, there were population densities here of 70,000 Native Americans. And it was three language groups that gathered here. This was really a tech transfer area. There were the Shumash from the coastal area, the, coast, the Sierra and Miwok from the Sierra Nevada, and the Miwok groups from the north in the valley. And this was an area where they brought materials from their home areas and traded those materials, worked those materials in their traditional ways. So it's one place where you see literally technology transfer from thousands of years ago occurring. And Tulare Lake, this ancient lake, <clears throat> was actually here fairly recently. And in fact, 
in 1888 at the North shore of Tulare Lake, there was a salmon processing plant. And in 1888, that plant processed almost a million pounds of salmon from a lake right here where we're standing. And 1888 is an interesting date for me because that's the year my grandmother was born. And I think about humans and time and landscape. And to think that in three generations, so much has happened here. It really challenges us to think about the decisions that we make now and how we move forward into the future. After 1888, there were actually three different African-American cavalry units that came to this area. So Colonel Allensworth was not the first presence of an African-American community in this part of California. There were two cavalry units that did um, work in the Yosemite Valley. And along with protecting the valley, they also did things like build trails. And in Sequoia National Park, there was a cavalry unit that was led by Colonel Andrew Young. And he actually built trails in the high country. And they're on the east side of Sequoia National Park. There's a trail called Old Army Pass. And it's a trail that I've hiked out of the Golden Trout Wilderness up onto the crest just south of Mount Whitney. So the history of African-Americans here goes deep. And of course, when Colonel Allensworth came here in 1906, this part of the valley was already a very active agricultural landscape for California and continues to be a really important agricultural part of the world. You know, one of the things that I think about is, is places like this for us, when we visit them, they actually become a part of our story. We've been here, we've seen it, we've sort of taken in the stories here. And I think for families of all backgrounds and particularly family, families of African-American backgrounds come here and actually, I hope, really have a sense of ownership. It's a sense of tradition. And the beauty of places like this is now we get to talk about carrying these stories forward because all of these peoples are still present still alive, still evolving, Native Americans, African Americans, Latino culture, the farming culture here, all cultures here are continuing to move forward. And Allensworth is a critical part of the San Joaquin Valley story of people. So thanks. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. You know, I, I, we usually start our Park Speaks by doing a land acknowledgement and I am learning along the way. And so I'm going to share a bit more than I typically do on land acknowledgement. So I'm gonna look at my card so I'm getting all of the names right and being respectful. Um, I do wanna take a moment to acknowledge that Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park is on the ancestral lands of the Yokuts, which today includes the Tachi Yokut tribe and the Tulare River Indian tribe. Allensworth is within the traditional territory of the Wowol, like the, the area of the beaver. Chowloon was the Wowol village near present day Allensworth that moved with the tithes of the Paashu, later called Tulare Lake, which you heard about from the director. Paashu is the center of the Yokuts world and their creation place despite its destruction and the loss of that, that lake. After the invasion, many Wowol arrived at the Santa Rosa Rancherita which, or, sorry, Rancheria, excuse me, which belongs to the Tochu Yoku, Tachi Yokut tribe. And you'll hear more about the tribe's connection to Allensworth when we hear from Leslie, but I just wanted to start the dialogue here tonight as we dive into the incredible history that's present on the land that we stand on. It's an honor for me to be able to speak to you about this, to be on my own learning journey and to share what I just did. So Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park, we're here in the schoolhouse. You heard the school bell. You can see what it looks like behind us with the desks, blackboards all around us. It has such a unique history. It's located here in the Central Valley, southwest of Fresno, northwest of Bakersfield. You saw, if you tuned in early on, it's an absolutely gorgeous night. Um, this is one of the most important independent settlements um, established by African-Americans. And that's why we wanted to bring attention here to tell these stories tonight to all of you. So thanks for joining us. Parks are here to give us history. They're here to share joy as well. Um, we're gonna get started. I'm gonna do my logistics like I typically do on Park Speak. Uh, we have a chat function. Tell us where you're listening in from tonight. I wanna to mention that in the past, we've had people from as far away as Vermont and Connecticut, maybe my family members. Um, my mom's always listening in Arizona. So I always have to say hi to my mom. And of course, across the state of California, including elected officials, which is so wonderful to have them kick us off tonight. Um, we also have a Q&A function. 
ask your questions throughout the program. If you like something, if you click a little thumbs up, it shoots that question up a little higher. And we'll get to that at the end of tonight's uh, discussion. But first, uh, a poll. How many of you have been here in person to Colonel Ellsworth State Historic Park in the past? So I know that's gonna show up on the screen. So you can tell us. I also want to acknowledge it has been a difficult year uh, with the pandemic and everything that happened around that. I hope you've all been staying safe and healthy. I hope you've been working on your own positive change in your own communities. Uh, for us here at Parks California, our mission is to connect people with place. It's to ensure that we're strengthening parks, but also ensuring that they're uh, ready for people to come and create their own relationship with these beautiful spaces. Um, Parks California is the statutory nonprofit partner of California State Parks, born through legislation. We're almost two and a half years old, which is sort of crazy when I think about it. Uh, we work statewide, and that means we work with 280 state parks, whether they're historic, like the one I stand in tonight, or wilderness or cultural. There are lots of different ways um, that you can engage, including in urban parks that are part of the state park system. Um, at almost two and a half years old, we are working on shared joint priorities that we set with the director and his team. And they focus on three key areas, access, interpretation, and education, um, natural resources protection and stewardship, and park capital improvements. We started this park speak, spark, park speak series last year when all of us were told we had to stay home. We thought there are so many stories that need to be whole, told, so many places that need to be visited. What if we tried to do it virtually? It's one of the reasons we started to work even more diligently to hold up, for example, the ports program that focuses on students and teachers and families during the pandemic and prior to that as well. And we thought Park Speak would be a great way to let you visit, in quotations, places when you couldn't physically get in your car and get here yourself. So it's so exciting for us to be able to talk about innovation and partnerships that are happening on the ground and think about how to scale these incredible partnerships moving forward. So I do wanna remind you, your support of Parks California at parkscalifornia.org does support California State Parks. And anything that is connected to, collected tonight through donations will be shared with the Friends of Allensworth, which is the cooperating association here. And you'll be hearing from Sasha, who's their president later on in the discussion tonight. So enough from me. Let's get into the incredible story and journey of this park. I wanna welcome Leslie Hartzell, California State Parks Cultural Resources Division Chief and the department's tribal liaison. Leslie, I'm handing it over to you. Uh, thank you, Kindley, and hello to everyone on this wonderful Earth Day. Um, thanks especially to Parks California for the opportunity to highlight Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park. It's a thrill to uh, have the event here today. Um, I'm going to set the stage for you a little bit about what we're going to do from here on, and there's a lot to learn and it's most exciting. So first off, I'm going to share a little bit more about the indigenous peoples that continue to call Southern Central Valley home. Uh, you'll learn about the significance of Allensworth as part of a national movement to establish safe communities for African Americans to express their civic ambitions in a time of racial violence in Jim Crow. You'll find um, how the historic town of Allensworth became a state historic park, and you'll be introduced to the planning process for updating visitor facilities at Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park that's kicking off. Finally, you'll hear from a representative of the Friends of Allensworth, the park's nonprofit partner organization. We have a full schedule and an incredible array of speakers, so let's get started. A reminder about the Q&A, please put your questions um, there, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. So let's get started again. Um, Director Quintero um, did a great job of um, setting the stage for what is the Tulare Lake Basin and the importance of this location um, in our state's um, history and particularly with water. Um, as you mentioned, a number of rivers flowed into the valley. The Kings, Tulare, um, Tule, Kawea, and Kern rivers uh, flowed once unchecked into the San Joaquin Valley, creating a network of rivers, creeks, sloughs, and lakes, supporting an abundance of life. If you've ever traveled on Highway 99 between Sacramento and Bakersfield and looked across that parched landscape you see today with the large-scale industrial agriculture that is fed by today's network of aqueducts, canals, and ditches, you may find hard to picture the vast flock of migratory birds, abundant fisheries, extensive tule marshes, and herds of tule elk that once were there. 
Prior to a century-long campaign of damming and diversions that started in the 1850s, these waters once fed the immense Tulare uh, Lake Basin, which in the mid-19th century encompassed nearly 100,000 square miles of water and wetlands. The contemporary Yokut tribes, whose traditional lands encompass the Tulare Lake Basin today, include the Tule River Indian tribe and the Tachi Yokut tribe. The Tachi Yokut tribe generously allowed us to share the following information, starting with their creation story. When all the world was water, Eagle and Raven gave duck fish to dive down in the bottom of the Pa'ashu to bring up mud on his hill. This mud was used by Eagle and Raven as soil for the land. Raven cheated and only put the soil on the west side. Eagle then brought two fish to duck and was given more soil because Raven had cheated. This is why the Sierra Nevada mountain range is taller than the coastal hills. Pa'ashu remains the center of the world for the Yokuts. This area was also important trade routes, as Dr. Um, uh, Director Quintero mentioned. It was a place where everyone would come down from the hills and share in the bounty of land, fresh water, and culture. Pa'ashu, that is Talari Lake, looked very different in the past. It was, as we've mentioned, the largest lake west of the Miss freshwater lake west of the Mississippi. Villages oscillated with the movement of the lake. Houses were easy to move, and this movement is reflected in songs. We are sincerely grateful to the Tule River Indian Tribe and Tachi Yokut Tribe for allowing us to share their continuing story of resilience with you today. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Susan Anderson, the History Curator and Program Manager at the California African American Museum in Los Angeles. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, I'm gonna talk about the Blacktown Movement and the context for Allensworth because Allensworth didn't spring up as a single town or as the result of one person's uh, thoughts. So um, between the late 18th and early 20th centuries, more than 1200 black settlements, enclaves and towns were established. I am looking for the slides. Thank you so much. And what you're looking at here is an image that is in the collections at the National Archives. The Blacktown movement peaked during the post-Reconstruction period, which was a betrayal of what the Union fought for in the Civil War and a betrayal of Reconstruction. And this is an illustration of the collaboration between violence and vigilantes. This is a detail of the same image from the National Archives showing an African-American couple cowering under a skull and crossbones with the words worse than slavery. White violence, the suppression of the rights of black people and economic exploitation created the first refugee crisis in the United States. It was something called the Kansas fever exodus the most remarkable migration in the United States after the Civil War. 6,000 African-Americans left Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas for Kansas in the space of a few months in 1879. And so many people left the South at this time that the United States Senate held hearings on the refugee crisis. There were leaders of the exodus such as Benjamin Papp Singleton. They were called exodusters, and they were not only looking to flee the South, but they wanted to build a life in the West. Singleton formed the Edgefield Real Estate and Homestead Association to help people buy land and build homes, uh, just as Colonel Allensworth and the founders uh, created a holding company to do the same thing in California. And later, one of Pap Singleton's sons would help settle Allensworth, Joshua Singleton. And uh, his wife, Henrietta Vera Singleton, was an important member of the community as a nurse and midwife. This is an image of one of the most famous of the Black towns in Kansas, Nicodemus, Kansas. On the left is the General uh, First Baptist Church. And on the right is a general merchandise store. And um, Nicodemus by 1880 
had a population of about 500 people. It had a bank, two hotels, three churches, a newspaper, a drugstore, three general stores, and it was surrounded by 12 square miles of cultivated farmland. And as the years went on, the town grew with more churches, stores, a literary society, a professional baseball team, an ice cream parlor, and the town passed a bond measure to lure the railroad to the town. And um, as was common in, in, in the West, the railroad conspired with local white citizens of other towns um, to uh, uh, divert the, tr the railroad away from Nicodemus. This also happened to Allensworth and it contributed to the decline of these towns. So from 18, we're looking at a map uh, from the Oklahoma S Historical Society of all black towns. Oklahoma was another place in the West uh, that was settled by independent black settlements. From 1865 to 1920, African-Americans created more than 50 identifiable towns and settlements in Oklahoma. And the red dots and letters that you see are towns that are still incorporated in Oklahoma. The first towns in Oklahoma were established after the Civil War by native people and freed people. The freed black people had been enslaved by the five tribes, Creek, Choctaw, Cherokee, Chickasaw, and Seminole. Those tribes had sided with the Confederacy during the Civil War. And what you're looking at is a photograph on the left of Jay Cootie Johnson, who is a Creek tribal member and a lawyer in the center, Seminole Chief Halputa Miko, and on the right, Okcha Hacho, a member of the Seminole Council. Uh, Jay Cootie Johnson on the left was the grandson of a slave that had belonged to the uh, chief of the Creek Nation. And Johnson was um, adept uh, in both Creek and Seminole language and laws and customs, and he fought both for Native rights and uh, African American rights in Oklahoma. One of the most famous Black towns in Oklahoma was Bowley. Um, Ida B. Wells, uh, Black Americans who had no ties to the five tribes were uh, migrating to Oklahoma to set up towns. Um, and Ida B. Wells, the famous crusading journalist who fought uh, lynching, visited Oklahoma in April 1892 and saw the chance that Black people had of developing manhood and womanhood in this new territory. Another important state, there were Black towns in nearly all 50 states. Uh, but uh, in the certain parts of the West, there was a predominance of these towns. And as you can see from this map that was put together by a project at Texas A&M College of Architecture, in Texas, there are 557 plus freedom colonies that have been plotted. And going back to the black codes that were passed after reconstruction and the 1866 Homestead Act of Texas that banned African-Americans from being able to buy public land that was available to white settlers, a freedman and their families started moving uh, in, uh, to settle in segregated quarters and um, their ownership of land, Black homesteaders and farmers went from 2% of all Texas farmland in 1870 to 31% by 1910. And these are images from one of the settlements in the Third Ward in Houston. Freedman's Town was established the year that the Civil War ended, and there are current preservation efforts underway in this area. Now we're moving to California because there were dozens of all black settlements and towns throughout California's history. What we're looking at here are two buildings in the Lincoln Heights enclave of Weed way up north 
in Siskiyou County. On the left is Danny's Barber Shop and on the right, Mount Shasta Baptist Church. Uh, black people were recruited in the starting in the 1920s by lumber companies in Louisiana to relocate in weed. So we're just giving two examples of some of these all black settlements showing you that one up in the far north and now going all the way down south to Imperial County where El Centro, uh, uh, where the black enclave in El Centro was established. Uh, Delilah Beasley, the famous journalist who wrote the Negro Trailblazers of California, wrote in 1919 that colored people live in great numbers in the Imperial Valley and are producers from the soil. They have their own churches and schools and apparently are happy and prosperous. Now, um, what you're looking at on the left is Washington Elementary School, on the right, Douglas High School, El Centro segreg deliberately segregated its schools in 1913. William Payne, who had been one of the founders of Allensworth, left Allensworth in 1914 after Colonel Allensworth was killed. And he moved his family to El Centro and he played a very important role as the principal of Douglas High School in training African-American teachers who came from all over the state. They were they were uh, prohibited from teaching in classrooms without having experience teaching in classrooms. So they were trained in El Centro and they were able to get jobs throughout the state. Now we're moving to the Central Valley, which is where Allensworth itself is located. And the Central Valley was very rich with many Black settlements. On the left, what you see is a map of African American settlements in the Central Valley. These settlements range from those that were established before Allensworth to those that were established after Allensworth. This was put together by Professor Michael Isinger. And on the right is an article in the Sacramento Daily Record from January 1887 with a long uh, discussion about cotton culture in the state. Large growers in the valley recruited black southerners to work in cotton fields starting in 1880. They did this partly to avoid hiring Chinese workers. This was at the height of the exclusion of the racist exclusion movement in California. And then in later decades, there were large numbers of black Dust Bowl uh, uh, refugees from places like Oklahoma. So long before he retired with his wife, Josephine and his daughters in Los Angeles in 1906, Colonel Allensworth had been lecturing about, dreaming about, planning about establishing an all black town. He was highly aware of the black town movement. And I believe he visited Bowley um, in Oklahoma and he and the founders of Allensworth held the same ideals of the desire for land, the need for safety, economic independence, and especially political autonomy. These were what motivated Allensworth and those who were co-founders of the town. Now wrapping up, what you're looking at is an image from last summer, 2020, um, uh, the, a mural painted uh, in the historically black neighborhood of Independence Heights in Houston, Texas. This was during the George Floyd murder protests. The mural says black towns matter. And in his speech, dedicating Allensworth in 1909, which was covered by the Los Angeles Times, Colonel Allensworth made clear what the primary intention of the town was. And he said the chief object of Allensworth will be to aid in settling some of the vast problems now before the country. Perhaps the greatest question before the American people today is the relation of the races. 
A large number of our fellow countrymen have been taught for generations that the Negro is incapable of the highest development of citizenship. And Allen's were said, if we expect to be given due credit, our race must be in a community where the responsibilities of its municipal government are upon them alone. Allensworth was able to uh, live up to the civic ambitions of the founders. It became the first all black voting precinct in California. It ran the first black school district. It was the first black judicial district in the state. Its residents elected California's first African-American justice of the peace in 1914. And the town's founders sought to show the world that the Negro can do and be everything that is expected of an intelligent citizenship. And now we turn to Geraldine Oliveira, State Park Interpreter at Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park. And Geraldine's going to tell us more about how this town became a state park. Hi, thank you, Susan, for that introduction. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Now, Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park started taking shape in 1970 when the California Department of Parks and Recreation were looking to honor African-American pioneers of the state. There were several places of note, but when it was discovered that the community of Allensworth was the only town founded, funded, governed, built, and settled by African-Americans, it became the overwhelming choice. The area was, uh, became park property in 1973 and then was officially dedicated and open to the public in 1976, October. There are um, several, oh, sorry about that. Over a course of uh, 24 years, there's been 21 buildings reconstructed here in the park. Now, through extensive research, archeology span and oral histories with some of the original residents of the community, they chose the interpretive period of 1908 to 1918. Those first 10 years were the most significant for the park or for the community, excuse me. The first reconstructions were of two of the most important structures of the community. And that was the historic schoolhouse in 1979 and the Colonel's house, which I'm standing in the parlor in 1980 to 81. Now, like I mentioned before, it was about 24 years it took to reconstruct all the buildings and their outstructure, uh, outbuildings into what the visitor sees today. There are seven buildings that have some original material in them and all the buildings are on their original properties. The park is self-guided, but there are ways to tour inside the buildings. You can call and request a guided tour. And a guided tour could be a single person, family groups, school tours, or bus tours. Second is a chance meeting with park staff while you're self-guiding. And then third is with Friends of Allensworth sponsored events that happen throughout the year in which we have docents in as many buildings as possible for tours to the visitors who are here enjoying the event festivities. We offer day use and overnight camping. Visitors can drive or walk the park, read the interpretive plaques, or dial into a cell phone tour that works with the park brochure. You can peek into the windows on most all the buildings and they are furnished to the interpretive time period. We get visitors from all over the world looking for a quiet place to camp or an unexpected, unique and interesting story to take with them on their travels. We, get, we do spread the word because we get a lot of campers here from Canada and the Netherlands. Now the park has joined the digital age. We are offering virtual tours through the California State Parks Ports Program. And we're reaching students that may not otherwise such a distance to travel. Another way to experience the park is with the Agents of Discovery game that is downloaded to your cell phone as a scab hunt where you can earn challenges and earn points.
Colonel Allen's first state historic park was listed as a California state historic landmark number 1047. We had a number of visitors here and guests that helped us celebrate that listing and the plaques right up at the front of the park for everybody to view and a great way to start your visit to the park. So like I mentioned, great variety of um, visitors here from locals taking an evening walk to bird watchers coming to see our single adult male vermilion flycatcher, European and Canadian visitors looking for the unexpected, elementary, high school, and college students here to do reports from a historic structure, the Buffalo soldiers, or human migration patterns of the West. We even get a few budding astronomers because we have an almost unobstructed view of the night sky. So I'd like to ask and invite all of you watching to come for the history, but stay for the sunsets. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Barney Matsumoto, who will be giving you more information about Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park in the coming years and months. Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine. Um, that's a great introduction there. Uh, my name is Barney Matsumoto, and I'm the manager of the Southern Service Center. Um, there are two service centers in the state parks, with my office being located in San Diego and the other office being located in Sacramento. As noticed in this catalog of services, the service centers are multidisciplinary studios comprised of designers, engineers, environmental, natural and cultural resource professionals. We provide the design, technical and project management services needed to keep our wonderful state park system open to be enjoyed by all, as well as being stewards of preserving and protecting the, our state's valuable natural and cultural resources, such as Colonel's Ellensburg State Historic Park. The Southern Service Center handles the parks generally from Hearst Castle down to the US-Mexican border and to the east to the Arizona border and many of the park beaches and parks along the southern coastline. Colonel Ellensworth State Historic Park falls within the Southern Service Center responsibility. At the early stages of this ongoing new visitor center project for Ellensworth, I came across an old newspaper article from the 1970s, which covered the initial planning for the Ellensworth land acquisition. Edward Pope, who's in the middle photograph, was an African-American landscape architect who worked at state parks during the Ronald Reagan administration. I found this most interesting and exciting because as a landscape architect myself, I am honored to be carrying on Edward Polk's mission of conveying the importance of this historic park. And I'm hoping to recast new light on this park with a new visitor center project. As part of the initial planning phrase under Edward Polk, many planning bubble diagrams were created including this one. I think we're gonna to have to go to the next slide here. There we go. This drawing was part of the original general plan for the park, which was approved in August, 1976, and illustrates various proposed land uses. Subsequent to this general plan, other, plan, other planning tasks have been completed, which resulted in various improvements at the park, including the addition of an entry kiosk, the reconstruction and restoration of various buildings, and the installation of the existing modular building, which currently serves as the park's visitor center. Also over the years, additional lands, approximately 781 acres surrounding the historic core is on the national, which is on the National Register of Historic Places have been added to the park. I think we need to be on the next slide here. Yeah, this slide shows the entire boundary of, of Colonel Ellsworth State Park. Subsequent to the recent site visit to Ellensworth, the Southern Service Center team created this master plan, which identified various repairs and project needs at the park. And we at state parks acknowledge much work needs to be done. However, the project my team is currently working on is not gonna solve all the park's problems, but rather we're gonna focus on creating a fresh visitor experience, which includes replacing the modular building shown in the area labeled here as 11 and 29. Now for a quick overview of the specific visitor center project. On this slide is the project description, the project process, 
Oops, let's back it right here. The project process and project milestones. All these documents will be posted on the public website and I will share this link with you at the end of the presentation. But a few general items I wish to point out on this slide. We are in the early project planning process, which we call the preliminary plan phase. We have planning and design funding for these initial tasks, but a typical capital outlay project takes three to five years to go from planning to design to construction. And during this process, stakeholder engagement will be very critical. Right now, we are working on some non-exciting site analysis um, uh, stuff, including examining the critical water needs and infrastructure, addressing the fire suppression needs, researching the technical and resource requirements such as, such as FEMA flood zones and avoiding sensitive resource areas. Also, we're looking to a few things we heard at a recent Park and Recreation Commission meeting where many friends of Allensburg members spoke up. We heard that they were concerned with the high speed rail impacts to the park, concerns with the grazing of cows in the buffer zones surrounding the park car, concerns of the water quality, and concerns of lack of intention of basically broken promises. And so we hope to resolve that with this project. The next slide will illustrate a few preliminary site concepts, but before I show these plans, I wish to share one of my design mantras. Although this project is titled a new business center, I always press upon my design team that we are to create a visitor portal versus creating an attraction in themselves. We are to create an expiring space that introduces the visitors to the park and then let the park speak to the visitors. Now, in this planning diagram of the existing visitor center location, we're calling this area number one. We show several structures versus just one structure to tread more lightly on the site and to be arranged based upon such things as the site is traditionally used for the Juneteenth event, the site is at the edge of the historic district as well as close to the historic school and library. And also it's close to the water source and treatment plant. However, this site needs to have a better sense of arrival and connection to the park entrance and we're working on that. In this next planning diagram, which we call the Northern location and area number two, it's actually the same signing as you saw in the previous slide, but we basically lifted it up and put it closer to the park entry. Actually, this, this site is consistent with the general plan. The site will help orientate visitors after entering the park, and the site is outside of the sensitive historic district. However, the site has some very sensitive plant and animal species to deal with. So those are the things we need to analyze as this process moves forward. These two concepts are at the very early stages, and as I said before, input from the stakeholder and public is gonna be sought and the team will be reaching out to the various groups as the planning process continues. In conclusion, as with, this, as with the first slide that I showed you where Everett Polk was standing in front of the original parks advocates and stakeholders, I too wish to convey the same strong commitment that Everett Polk had and put forth, which led to the first wave of critical improvements at the park. My team is committed in completing this visitor center so we can better interpret and educate the public of Colonel Ellsworth's grand vision and his struggles. On this slide, I inserted a photo of me with my uh, son on a recent trip to Ellsworth, as well as another photo of me with my daughter on a visit to Manzanar, which is an internment camp similar to the ones that my grandparents and my parents were actually uh, interned during World War II. Why? Because I see my involvement with all these park projects as great teaching moments of the many lessons to be learned from such important people as Colonel Ellsworth and to remember such important moments in time in our country's history. Thanks for your time. And at the bottom of the slide is the public website. So you can check on the status of the business center planning process. And I encourage all of you to uh, submit your comments regarding the business center as the project continues to move forward. At this point, I'd like to introduce to Sasha Bisco, the president of the Friends of Ellensburg. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Allensworth. I am standing here in the schoolhouse. I am Sasha Bisco, the president of the Friends of Allensworth. We are the nonprofit cooperating association connected to Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park via a contract with California State Parks. We, here, we are here to put on um, events to raise money for the interpretive program at the park. 
we normally put on four events. Um, February, we, put, we do um, Black History Month. May, we do Jubilee. In June, we celebrate Juneteenth. And in October, we do the rededication event where we rededicate ourselves to continuing to work with Colonel Allen Ford State Historic Park and California State Park to keep the history of Allensworth, the people who came here, the history before Allensworth alive for future generations to enjoy. So we do invite you to come out to Allensworth during our events or at your leisure. Um, look around, learn about the history of Allensworth, learn about the people who came here and the joys of living here, the successes of living here, the happiness of living here. It was a great place to live. Uh, it's really a shame that it did not make it as a town, but it is now a state historic park, thanks to state parks. So we appreciate that. We are definitely excited about the new visitor center. We are looking forward to having that and turning Allensworth into a place of education, not just in entertainment. Um, so we want to have the visitor center and have professors come from all over to come to Allensworth to teach about black history, um, the, the history of the Indians that were here before us. Um, so there's so much to do out here, um, so much to learn. So we have a lot of anticipation for the new visitor center and all that we can do uh, with the visitor center. Um, like I said, we are the nonprofit association. So we are here to raise money for the interpretive program at the park. We um, also, if you go to our website, friendsofallensworth.org, our store is on the website. So you can shop on the store, you can make donations and you can also go there into our Facebook page and uh, keep up with the events. At this point, the park is closed. So our events are virtual. Uh, we have, we're working on May event and Juneteenth event, which should be two virtual events. Hopefully they will be our last two virtual events and hopefully we will be back in the park October for rededication. So um, that's basically it for me. So I would like to turn it back over to Ken Lee. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Wow. So, what an amazing opportunity to learn so much about this beautiful place. Thank you to everyone. Uh, we're going to make a little bit of time for Q&A now. But before we do that, I wanted to just bring Director Quintero back on and um, talk for a minute. That was a pretty astonishing amount of information that we were able to share and learn in a short period of time. So first of all, thanks to all of you for dialing in for listening in um, and for going on this journey with us. What did you think? Well, from our cultural resources managers to our park partners, I mean, it was a, it was a full story. Yes. And it's, I love the way that these parks become illuminated with the stories around them. And I think we were really, it was really fortunate today to be able to pull everybody together to mm -hmm. tell us more about Allensworth than any of us, any one of us probably knew. But um, I think that's true for all parks. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea of having a place that really focuses on black history as a part of the California State Park system is extraordinarily important. So I'm really looking forward to the progress that we're able to make here to make this a more engaging place, a place that tells a fuller story and really am appreciate, appreciative of the Friends of Allensworth and the, park, and the park leadership here, working with the Friends is just really critical. And of course the visitors. So come down and take a look here, it's pretty amazing. That's great. Well, stay with us and we'll have Sasha do the same. I think we're going to go to Q&A now. Just a reminder that you can donate through Parks California at parkscalifornia.org or if you see a chat box showing up on your screen, um, we'll share proceeds tonight from friends, uh, anything that we earn tonight with friends of Allensworth. Uh, always donate to Parks California on behalf of California State Parks as well. So Q&A, we'll have a mystery voice asking some of these uh, to any of the speakers that spoke tonight. So why don't we take a time to answer a few of those questions. I know that we've had a long program, um, but I am going to give it over to the mystery voice. Hi, thank you, Kinley. Mystery voice here. Um, our first question is, unfortunately, it, um, it doesn't 
nobody can address it, um, but maybe Susan can possibly answer it. And the question is, are there any African-American historical society groups in California? Um, yes, there are. Um, you know, California, uh, African-American history is woven throughout the state of California. And I would actually use this as an opportunity to say that African-American history is woven throughout the history of many of the parks in the state park system. Um, so there are uh, in throughout the state, in San Francisco, um, in Los Angeles, in Fresno, in other parts of the state, there are different organizations, whether they're historical societies, whether they're history museums, or whether they're organizations that have been around for decades that work on Black History Month, there are those kinds of organizations. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, our next question is, there is a Buddha on the piano. That's unexpected. Can you comment? And I believe this is for Gerilyn. Yes, I can comment. Um, I've heard two different stories about the Buddha. Uh, the, it is, it did belong to the Colonel and it was possibly either a gift given to him by the regiment um, from the gentleman when they went to the Philippines during the Philippine insurrection. He was also in Manila uh, during that time and it could have possibly been something he purchased for himself. And so uh, it's still a little murky. We don't have the exact, but those are the two stories that I'd heard about the Buddha. Wow, that's awesome. Okay, our next question is, can I make a reservation for a tour of the inside of the school building this weekend? Unfortunately, due to COVID, we are still not allowing people into the buildings. So everything is still on its self-guided. But as things move and change, um, we're hoping that soon that will change and you will be able to make a reservation. But unfortunately, not for this weekend. Yes, thank you for that, Gerilyn. Um, Our next question is, since the government plans to open, will there be a Juneteenth event this year? That would be a great question for Sasha. So we'll invite Sasha back on. Sasha, don't worry about the microphone. We can hear you just fine. Okay. okay. Um, yes, we are planning a Juneteenth celebration. It will be virtual due to the park. Um, even if it's open, it's too close for us to put on a event at the park. So it will be a virtual event. We did do a virtual event for October and February, and they're on our uh, Facebook page. So that'll give you an idea of what we do. That's exciting. Thank you, Sasha. Um, okay. So our next question is for Barney. What are some of the native plant life species um, at Allensworth? Unfortunately, I saw that question pop up on the screen. I don't have that information ready available, but whoever asked that question, should, if you submit via the website, I'll get that data for you from our resource uh, uh, scientists for you. All right. Thank you, Barney. Will do. Okay. Our next question um, is, what is the interpretive theme of the new visitor center? Please share your collaborative efforts with the African-American and native indigenous communities. Thank you. And I believe this is, might be for Barney. I apologize for that. I missed the question on that. I think that's Leslie or Gerilyn. Yeah, I think it might be for Leslie if it's a cultural related. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so the interpretive things, themes are um, further being developed um, as part of the um, preliminary planning process uh, for the focus. There's been quite a bit of planning that has gone on before. This this is a project that Parks has been um, uh, had on the on the priority list for a long time to finally get funded and move ahead. So that will be part of the preliminary planning process. Uh, regarding um, 
uh, engagement and collaborations. Um, we just, in fact, started our uh, discussions with the Native American communities that kindly helped us with the land acknowledgement and historical background information about um, the tribe's uh, history in this area, as well as their contemporary lives. And um, that did start off those conversations for the visitor center planning specifically um, recently. And uh, regarding Native American, excuse me, African American uh, collaborative efforts that is also part of the stakeholder involvement and that's why Barney keeps redirecting you to the, uh, uh, the special web page uh, about the visitor center uh, planning that's underway where you can sign up and get information and uh, contribute so that process is just kicking off and today's the day we're getting it out there publicly about the funding uh, in place and the team is in place and we're ready to go thank you that's great thank you Leslie um, a lot of, a few people are really interested in getting the links and dates for the Friends of Allensworth virtual events. Um, hopefully the panelists will be able to provide those links. Um, and so that takes care of that question. Um, we have a new question from the chat and that is, we would like to learn how Coronel Allensworth obtained the land to settle. Um, I'll go ahead and take that. Uh, what the founders did was very commonly done at that time. They worked through a land acquisition company um, that was kind of a go between uh, between the organization that the Allensworth founders had to promote Allensworth as a place for families and people to come settle. And, and enter, there was a, a, a land acquisition company that was the intermediary that people actually bought the plots um, from. So people bought individual plots for their businesses and for their homes through that, through that company. And it was a very common setup uh, throughout the country, throughout the West that they, that they used. Excellent, thank you so much, Susan, for the information on that question there. I think we're gonna go ahead and get ready to wrap it up. So let's hand it back over to Kinley and Director Quintero to close out for us today. That's great. Thank you for all of the questions. I'm sure there are many more that want that want to ask. You know, there are ways of reaching out to the Parks California mailbox. The Friends of Allensworth has a Facebook page. You can message them there. And of course, there's parks.ca.gov that might be able to answer some of the questions that you have if you search a park and go to Colonel Allensworth. So I do want to say thank you to everybody who spoke today. We had um, our district representative, Joseph, for Senator Hurtado. We had Assembly, Assembly Member Mathis. Um, we had Director Quintaro. Thank you so much for being here. It was so sure. wonderful to do this in person with you. And then, of course, our historians, our cultural holders, our storytellers, Leslie, Susan, Geraldine, Barney, and Sasha. This has been an absolute joy and such a wonderful way for me to learn as well. It was such an honor to be in this incredibly important place, Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park with all of you. I'm Kinley from, Par from Parks California. I almost said Kinley from Parks Speak, but I guess I'm that as well. Just a reminder, you can donate to Parks for all of the amazing work that they do across California through parkscalifornia.org or in the chat box you see on your screen. We'll share tonight's proceeds with Sasha and the friends of Allensworth. Thank you so much, everyone. Can't be back together. We can't wait to be back together with you soon. Good night. <laughs>